happy that Tom Thurile is here with us to talk about his ministry to survivors. He's somebody who's known by many survivors around the country. Um, I consider him a really wonderful friend and inspiration. And a lot of the survivors you've been hearing from today uh, will track back their experience of healing to Tom. In fact, Tom, you're to be honored or blamed for the existence of the Healing Voices magazine because you introduced a group of us from whom this idea of the newsletter sprung and then it turned into a, a pretty vibrant community of people, of writers and of, of people contributing. So thank you. You're welcome. That's one thing I do feel proud of, bringing the people together. Oh, it's what you do well. And I, I have to say, when Spirit Flare does its introductions, we just tell people how wonderful people are. We don't always go to their credentials, less people put credentials over amazingness. But could you introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about your credentials and then we'll we'll go into the spotlights of your life that are part of this story. Uh, well, I've been with the Archdiocese of Chicago as the director of the Office of Assistance Ministry since 2011. I guess this February will mark my 10 year anniversary. Wow. And um, my professional background before that is I have my LCSW, I have a board certification. I, in clinical social work, I had been in private practice. I was teaching in the School of Social Work at Loyola as an adjunct. I was working with students. Um, my, my whole intention when I got into this field was to do that, to work as a therapist and to do some teaching, to work with students. This wasn't even on my radar, to be honest. Yeah. And then we just continued to surprise you from there going forward. <laughs> yeah, you're um, right. It's, uh, it, it's really wonderful to talk to you because they're in, we're, we're going to go through a couple of snapshots of your life leading you to this work. And, and why don't we start in the 1990s, but also, and that would include kind of where you raised Catholic, a little bit behind, you know, why, why you're even involved with the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Well, Teresa, I... The easiest way to put it is my parents um, came from India. My father came in maybe the late 50s to come here for school. And he was brought here because his uncle was the bishop of the diocese in Kotayam, India. And the connection was there's a couple, Pat and Patty Crowley, who were very involved with Christian family movement. They were involved with, I think, working on Vatican II in terms of meeting with the bishops to talk to them about contraception and all this. And, but they had met with the bishop and then they helped my father come here to the US uh, to study here. And, you know, as I talked about in this other article, Catholicism was sort of the anchor for our family with a lot of other things changing. That was one thing they kind of held on to. And so it was, my choices were pretty much, you can either go to a Catholic school or you can go to a Catholic school. So I was gonna to go to Catholic elementary, Catholic high school, Catholic college. Um, that was their beliefs, that was their philosophy. And, um, you know, so that that's what I was rooted in. And as a part of that, I did, yeah, I made a lot of friends. I had a lot of experiences different than my family's experience in India with, with Catholicism. But um, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of the background. So you, so you come, yeah, you, and you also understand a lot of us who were raised very, very Catholic. In, in terms of our experiences. So let's just, let's just start with, let's say 1990. Mm -hmm. Lawsuits maybe getting into the news a little bit in certain cities. You'd have to really be reading the news a lot to find news of it. Um, what was your, what were you up to in the 1990s? Well, in the 90s, I was returning to graduate school. And so I was thinking about, um, I was, my head was in how can I make my professional ambitions kind of come true? And so I was loosely paying attention to the clergy sexual abuse um, stories because, you know, having gone to the high school equivalent of the seminary here for high school, um, you know, my friends and I were all very tuned into a lot of the people, the priests in the city. We had friends over priests. We were steeped in the Catholic community here. And so I can remember friends of mine saying, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Like hear about a priest that was teaching yeah. at our high school. 
And to be honest with you, it was still hard for me to get my head around the idea of this happening. Because, you know, we knew these priests in a certain way. And to try to conceptualize what they were saying, I, I could hear it, but it was hard to know what was real and what wasn't at the time. Yeah. Um, but my focus was not necessarily on this then. It was really more about just um, continuing with graduate school and working my way through this, but you know, keeping an eye on what was going on. And then did you go into practice at the immediate, like, you know, teaching and practice at the same time? What was the story? No, because in order to get your LCSW, you have to put in sort of 3,000 hours of clinical training. So of all places, I ended up working at Jewish Family and Community Service. So I had a whole other experience there. And I uh, got my training there, loved it, good supervision and all of that. And, and again, it was a break from some of this other stuff. Yeah. But yeah, that's where I was yeah. before I ever, I didn't really get back into all of this until I was teaching. And talk about when that was and, and how you did. Um, so there was probably in, uh, the late 90s or so, maybe into the early 2000s. Um, I was teaching at Loyola and also doing these supervising students at this field internships. And it so happened one of the students was at the Office for the Protection of Children and Youth. And so I went there, I met with my predecessor, I met with some others specifically around students, but we connected and I was happy to see that there was an office like that available. I was surprised, but I was happy to hear about that. And they asked me at that time, would you be interested in running some groups for men that had been sexually abused okay. and by clergy? And I said, yeah, I'd be open to it because I did like group work and I was teaching classes about group work. Yeah. So um, I decided to take it on. And also you like making connections between and among people as all of us know. But the, in, in the, and you know, groups have been really helpful in a lot of different dioceses. What was your, what was your experience walking into a group, starting to hear the stories of the men in the group. I mean, it, it must have really brought this into real focus for you, where it had, had been on the margins, I guess I would say. Yeah, I'm, I, there's no doubt about it in my mind. That experience of leading those groups is what expanded my mind in terms of this issue. Because when I would listen to the men, they were no different to me than the guys I grew up with in Catholic school. So they were talking, initially it was just like a group of guys getting together, joking around a little bit, and they were talking about silly things and, or, or, and or recalling moments from childhood, like when they were altar boys or in the choir. And there were certain things that we all connected around. And then there was a certain point where their narrative took a very different turn. Yeah. And that's what blew me away, is when when I would hear story after story after story about these really painful experiences, uh, that it really shook me. It really shook me to my core. And I, I can't explain much more than that, other than it deeply affected me. Um, yeah. and you, but you also, you also were walking with men who were working through these memories and moving toward, I hope, healing of some type. Healing is a weird word, but let's say, um, toward a way of living with this in a, in, a, in a more healthy and safer way, at least just even being with each other and hearing each other talk. Yeah, and they were also, through that process, giving me a perspective on what their experience has been coming forward with their allegations or, and how they were perceiving it. Yeah. And that was helpful for me to sort of understand, well, what are victim survivors thinking as they go through this process? And it helped me, especially once I started here, to understand how different at times that perspective was from what I was hearing internally and what the internal experience was. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, you're sort of in between those. One of the strange aspects of the job you you play is you're you're between you're between both of those perspectives. At times, can offer insights, especially into the church, into what the survivor is going through, and in some of the best circumstances, that can really help survivors be heard that it's not just the process but it's it's not a wounding process yeah i hope it's not a wounding process i mean i think one of the things that's you know when you were talking about being a connector i mean one of the things i realized was a lot of the victim survivors i was meeting with had a lot to offer they had a lot of wisdom to share if the church was receptive to listening to them yeah. and fortunately by bringing victim survivors together 
you know, you know for yourself, you guys started forming connections, breaking out of, you know, what for many is an isolated experience to realizing, hey, I'm not alone. And then, you know, you and Mike and others quickly started forming healing voices or taking action. And that was, that was really exciting to see. It was also exciting because it was, it was wonderful to find a bunch of survivors, all very unique, but that it were, were not the caricature. Everybody, to start realizing even in ourselves how fabulously strong and resilient everyone was. And everybody was dealing with it differently. Um, yeah. But there were some really powerful people out there with some really awful stories who were living well lives, even though still hurting. Yeah, and I think what, I, what was happening was at the time, and I think things have changed in this regard, but at the time, I would get calls from victim survivors from other places that didn't feel like they had anyone they could connect to. And that was what eventually started happening where I thought, they're calling me, but they probably would benefit from connecting with one another. Um, the number so of was, survivors I met through you who were from other places and they were living isolated, but some way or other they would find your name because your name is out there in the circuit, as you know. Um, much trusted by people who don't even know you yet, survivors who don't know you yet. But then you really helped create a place where people can come in, talk, get to know each other a little bit, um, and, and experience life from other survivors. And you know, it's it's really lovely when the di some dioceses have been quite successful, like you're saying with the men's groups or with the gatherings, to provide that, but to provide it to all of the people who are isolated. Um, that's an incredible piece that I really do track back to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember, you, you're you going to be one of the really oldie but goodie um, victim assistance coordinators, because if you do hit a decade, you know, the burnout rate for your job is pretty high. Yeah. And you're still standing. Um, so I guess that would be t about 2010 or so that you started. What was the... What kind of programs go on in the archdiocese of Chicago that, you know, you just would maybe help people understand there are quite a few things that are happening, but Catholics generally don't always know either. Right. I mean, I think, you know, I think more and more people have heard about the Healing Garden, for example, and having a space like that, that, you know, allows victim survivors a place to go within the church where they can feel safe, where they can read you know, read quotations, read signs that kind of resonate with them, that feel like, you know, like, like someone within the church understands them. Yeah. There's, um, like you talked about the men's group, which kind of evolved at one point into this, from an ongoing support group type of thing to more of a peace circle, which would be a one-shot group, which then eventually turned into uh, victim survivors leading the groups for victim survivors. Right. So it's kind of had its own evolution. And then uh, I'm in the midst right now, as you know, working with a, a committee of victim survivors, clergy, and clergy that have been affected by this issue in their own in their own ways, yeah. um, and staff to put together the ninth uh, Master of Hope and Healing. So we're going to try this virtually, and you're going to be a part of this along with, you know, some others. And we're trying to see what it, what would it be like to have a variety of voices from all over, as opposed to just those voices locally. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think sometimes when I meet with victim survivors, when they come forward, I meet with my colleague, I was the director of child abuse investigation or review. So when we have that first meeting, I try to think about resources that might be helpful for them. And sometimes that's, of course, sometimes that's therapy. Sometimes that's even, you know, sending them a link to one in six or an online site where they can gather information uh, but the number of folks I've met with that feel just so alone and so relieved to finally be able to tell their story, I try to figure out how can we support them based on what we have available. Yeah, you've always taken that story telling piece really strongly. I think, um, and also one of the things you do is I, and I'll, it's even from my experience, recently a dog passed away. And it, you, as you know, it just took me down a lot. It's my support dog. And I remember I had a deadline for you and all I had to do, all I had to do was call and say, you know, it's a dark day. Can I have a couple days? And it, 
I didn't need to explain it. I didn't have to worry about your overreaction to it. You knew. You knew about resilience. You knew about the arc of just having to go through it. It's, a, it's an amazing gift to be able to have somebody sitting there able to do that. And then, of course, I, I met a different deadline for the same thing. But yeah. it was really important that it's like an anchor for people to be able to call. And you, you get it. We don't have to explain yeah. anything. And then we can start from there. I appreciate it. But, you know, you also need to know, in case I haven't said it, that, you know, Mike Hoffman was a critical player here in Chicago in terms of helping me. Yeah. But then you were the first person I talked to outside of the diocese, because when the Cardinal, Cardinal George gave me your book and I read it, I, and I thought about the men that I had been sitting with and I thought, oh my God, I've never written to someone who's the author of a book. And I remember telling my wife, I've got to write to this woman. She really seems to get it in a way that I haven't heard other people talk about this issue. And, uh, and I was glad that we were able to connect and that you were able to then write for the newsletter at the time. And that's right. It's actually, that's a, I remember that now. And I, I have forgotten about Cardinal George because he must have read it to recommend it. And, um, and I do remember you writing me and it made my day like, oh my goodness, one person read my book. <laughs> but then from there, you again, to meet somebody who already understood the trauma piece uh, and, the, and, and the relationship that can still be had. Yeah. But, you know, and in some ways, I don't know, Tom, I think sometimes it's a, it's a richer relationship because it's, it requires authenticity from mm. the start. Because it gets, Well, it, and to be honest with you, part of what, what I like about this work is that I'm meeting people often at a time when they are, they're the, at their most vulnerable, you know, because they're at that point of saying, I don't know what to do. I'm just taking a risk of faith to even come forward. Yeah. And then it's, you know, then there's, then it opens the door to saying, if you're willing to take that risk, I can certainly use whatever resources I have through the diocese to help you inch your way forward. Isn't it something too, because I've experienced it too, watching both in diocese and then even with, um, People come to the Healing Voices, we often encourage them to connect with their diocese if that's where they've been hurt. Um, and they do over time when they feel safe. But when that click happens, people start to flourish on another level. It's not always easy. I'm not trying to make it sunny. But there's, a, there's an infusion of grace and connection that, you know, you don't find other places. Yeah, and you know, when I was, when I was training to do therapy, I was in this old school model of treatment, and you know it was more of a long-term um, treatment model. And yeah. being here nine years, there are some similarities in ter in terms of what's involved with forming relationships. And one of the things that I've taken away from this is um, I've had the chance to see people when they first come in, and experience people when perhaps they were just angry with me, angry with the church, angry with everything about this, to seeing a point where they wanted to reconnect with their faith perhaps, or wanted to reconnect with other victim survivors, or where they're at the point where they're ready to read at the Mass of Hope and Healing. You know, that, that experience of seeing someone cycle through these different stages of healing has been pretty satisfying. And just for the people watching, it's not like the anger isn't in incredibly important to oh, the no, process, it's yeah. but it's, but it's, it, what happens is when people aren't resisting it and when it has a place, then the relationship can grow bigger. It's really, it's really quite healthy, even for somebody as angry as possible watching this right now. Um, yeah. And I mean, the truth is everybody, I, if I were to like chart out like stages of development, yeah. I would say one stage is definitely feeling angry and that stage may last for many years. Yeah. But I, I guess, in the same way, when I used to work with people who were alcoholics, and they would talk about how you would have a person with five years of sobriety or 10 years of sobriety holding out the possibility that as bad as it feels right now, there is actually a way this can all feel better. Yeah. And that's what I've sort of witnessed with, you know, working with a variety of victim survivors, and those that have chosen to say they're going to put their time into whatever, therapy, groups, writing, doing whatever they need to do. And then they've made themselves available to others who are coming forward for the first time. Yeah. 
that process has been very satisfying. It has been, and you, I've known a lot of people who you've really helped. It's a good time to talk about that, though. It seems like now it's almost the vogue to, and I don't mean to, to diminish the lay people's interest in, in helping the church take the steps it still needs to take. But there's this strange thing where now that people acknowledge us, I mean, I've been around since 82, and this is a little bit of a surprise, but the... But now a lot of lay groups will invite survivors to come to talk, to be part. That's fantastic. To actually belong is really a wonderful experience. But we're hearing from a lot of survivors who go that they end up coming away wounded, re-wounded, not by bad people, not by lay people with anything in their heart but love, but still can re-wound them. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it's really good to, if you're going to start bringing survivors into a Catholic setting, it'd be really smart to connect up with people who do that. For example, the, the, the victim assistance coordinator in a diocese. That second wound, Tom, it's a lot, you know, it's, I mean, it's something you have to work against every day mm -hmm. that you work. Well, you know, I mean, when we go for those initial interviews, for example, I know that that moment is a pretty critical moment in the, in the healing arc, if you will. So that at that moment, we can really screw it up if we say the wrong thing, or we can perhaps help the person, victim survivor, inch a little bit forward from where they are. And hopefully that's the, the mission of all victim assistance um, coordinators, you know, is to be present for them, to try to listen to them, and to try to help them um, take a step forward. And I've met enough victim survivors around, uh, victim assistance coordinators around the country to know that they're there. Now, of course, there's going to be some that miss the mark. Right. You know? right. But I think the intention, for the most part, is positive, is, uh, is to try to help, to try to support, and to use the resources of the diocese to help. And also, one of the things is to know what to say and what not to say in those, in those nadirs of, of agony. Um, there are things that make perfect sense five weeks later, but those early times, those early conversations are very, they're just so brave to just show up, even if, even to a second, third, or fourth one. I remember I was visiting a, a priest who was had in, in Arlington, was really supportive of what I was doing, and he was, he would recall later that I would show up in like five or six coats. And, and I didn't even know it. And it would even be summer and they'd be lightweight coats, but it would be layers and layers and layers. And now, you know, I look back and, um, but he was trauma informed enough to know. And he would just put the air conditioning up and never ask me if I wanted to take my coat off, you know, because he knew enough to accept. Now, of course, that's a level of finesse that goes well beyond what a normal Catholic would have, but it is part of a knowledge because it yeah. would have been really stressful for me if he tried. Yeah, and I think what, if I'm hearing you right, I mean, one of, one of the issues I've seen since the McCarrick revelations and the Pennsylvania grand jury is, you know, I'm sure Chicago wasn't alone, but there was a massive uptick in parishioner involvement around this topic. There were listening sessions all over and people wanting to, with the best of intentions, wanting to fix, wanting to solve, wanting to come up with a solution. I think where maybe they were a little short-sighted is that this is a slow, slow process. You know, I mean, it's going to take a while. You know, like even with the Mass of Hope and Healing, what I see is every year, we might have a couple more people show up that had been thinking about it for a year or two before they were able to show up or be involved in it. It's, it's, it's not a quick fix you know, right. in terms of that. I love that you bring that up because I think those masses of hope and healing really are for all Catholics because I, I view them all Catholics as having a broken heart over this minimally. Mm -hmm. And, and the, there's healing to be done. And it's taken lay Catholics a long time to realize that they're even hurt enough to warrant going to be healed. And it, it's part yeah. of our welcome, but we understand that it's really hard. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, even recently, I was talking to this one, one reporter about PTSD. He was kind of asking me about that and asking, like, whether that was really something that victim survivors experience. And I was 
I was trying to describe it to somebody else. I was saying, recently for this mass, I was doing some videotaping of a priest who was at the parish I grew up in. And so I said, I was standing at the uh, top of the stairs, uh, the landing for the church. And I was just kind of looking over the landscape and saying, that's where we used to, that's where we used to play. I can hear the bell ring. Over there's where we used to, you know, hit the chalkboard, uh, the erasers. Oh, there's the gym where we play basketball. There's the street where we did the crossing guard. All the memories came flooding back. And they were good memories for me for the most part, you know. And, but I thought if I can have those memories, why wouldn't someone who's been traumatized or victimized have a similar set of memories that would make it horrific for them to stand in front of the church or to go into the church for a baptism or to hear the music from the organ? You know, it, it, it's not that complicated if people want to allow it in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's also, there's a lot of hope for survivors when you realize that's the mechanism going on mm -hmm. with people who understand how to walk through and maybe diffuse those triggers some. Yeah. But it, it also explains why some survivors are just not going to turn, you know, step back into a church too, which is. A yeah. I mean, that, that comes up so frequently, you know, yeah. where people are saying, I mean, I mean, people are both angry and frustrated that along with being sexually abused, their faith was stolen from them because yeah. they can't figure out how to return to the church, even if they wanted to return to the church, if they were struggling with the question of returning, how can they do it without feeling either physically re-traumatized or just feeling like they just can't do it? I understand. I mean, even some Sundays I go, it's, it's not, going to mass is not a, is a complex thing for me. It's not that I go in and I'm bored and it's just the thing I do on Sunday morning. And so it's really, <laughs> that's also part of people understanding. And that's part of the welcome, I think, that's really important, too. But, Tom, this is a lovely, lovely chat. Um, is there anything that I haven't caught that you might like to say before we wrap it up today? No, just, you know, thanks for having me here today. I appreciate all that you're doing. You know, one of the greatest moments for me was seeing you and Lewis speaking to... Yeah. Um, the bishops at the U.S. Bishops Conference. I just thought, wow, who would have thunk that? You know, I mean, he, he, there they are. And it, yeah. those moments make this work satisfying for me to just see victim survivors that I've been able to meet, been able to talk to, been able to connect with other victim survivors, but then to see you guys take off and spread your message, that's, that's really satisfying. Well, thanks, because that, you know, for me, I'm standing up there because of all the help you've given me. So God bless you and your work. And uh, I, you know, I can't say thanks enough, but I hope you have a lovely afternoon and evening now. Thank you. Okay. You too. Take thanks. care, Teresa. <laughs>